Right, well, hello everybody, and welcome to my June 2020 Planetarium show. This is a show put together to show you exactly what's in the sky and visible this month, either directly with the naked eye or with binoculars or a small telescope. And in fact, we zoom in on a few objects using uh, professional telescopes as well, just to show you them in their full glory. I'll set the uh, show running. And we're configured for the 1st of June and it's in the afternoon at the moment with the sun in the sky. But we're going to run time forwards. We've got full control of uh, where we're looking and the time so that we can bring the sun down and bring it towards the horizon. Here we go. And as the sun descends towards the horizon, gradually you'll see that uh, glow in the sky as the ch colour changes towards a more orangey colour and then it's just going to dip down right below the uh, far horizon there and then we're going to bring it to a stop. We've stopped here because we're going to zoom right in and show you the planet Venus. This is the last chance to see it as it's overtaking the Earth on the inside as it passes uh, round its orbit more quickly than we do. It catches up with us and now it's at what's called inferior conjunction, which means it's almost directly in line between the sun and the earth. And so we're looking at the night side of Venus. So it renders it almost impossible to see. You might just catch the thinnest of thin crescents poking out around the edge there. Uh, it's been absolutely glorious sight all the way through the month of May. But now this is really the, the end. It's going to pass in front of the sun and then it'll become the morning star. So next month we'll be seeing it early in the pre-dawn sky glowing there. So that's the planet Venus. Very, very difficult to spot uh, actually going through the rest of June. We've had some fantastic views of it and I've taken some photographs of it and shown the different phases of it as it's progressed through May. So we've zoomed back out again and we're just going to let time run forward to 9.30 just so that the sky is a little bit darker and the sun's a little bit below the horizon. Actually in June, it really being midsummer, the sun doesn't go very far below the horizon at all and the sky never really gets properly dark for us here in Cambridge. But just poking through the trees here, you can see the little white dot there. That's the planet Mercury, the inner planet, a companion of Venus that orbits round between uh, uh, the Earth and the Sun. It's the nearest planet to the Sun. And here's Mercury just showing a half-lit disk. We're looking at it uh, at its furthest angular separation from the Sun when the uh, half of the day side and half of the night side are visible to us. And of course, the midpoint of the day side is pointing down to the right towards the sun. Now, I've only seen Mercury with a telescope four times in 40 odd years of observing because it is very difficult to catch. And uh, that's illustrated here by the fact that it's so low on the horizon, even at its best, that the uh, simulation in the planetarium software is showing it to be through a tree. Uh, and that's typical of my experience of trying to observe Mercury is that you going to catch it between the leaves of the trees right on the horizon um, and if you live anywhere where there are hills well forget it you've probably got no chance at all it's only a few degrees above the horizon so now let's go in search of some proper darkness we'll move on to 11 o'clock at night and so mercury and the sun and venus will all disappear but now the stars are beginning to come out you'll see a few more of the brighter stars there that's uh, Capella on its own over to the right. And the two that are following Mercury down, those are the twins of Gemini, Castor and Pollux there. But over here, we've got the uh, moon nicely in the south, just past half phase now. And it'll soon become full later in the month and then on through over into the early morning sky. And when you see it at three quarters like this, you get a good view of quite a lot of the large uh, impact basins, the mare there, 
the dark regions that the Greeks thought were flooded areas. Well, they were flooded, but they were flooded millions of years ago with liquid rock, which has solidified, and that's what gives them the smooth appearance. Now here's the constellation of Leo to the right of the moon. Now it really does look a bit like a lion, in this, even in the stick drawing. We can put the artwork on and show you where the lion is supposed to be, and I think you'll agree it's not a bad representation. And uh, so one or two objects that are of interest in Leo, when we're looking in this direction from the Earth, we're looking up out of the galaxy, out of the Milky Way, and towards lots of other galaxies that we can see. And here's a group of them. You can see a couple at the bottom there, but we've zoomed right in on this trio. And these are three smallish galaxies, uh, easily findable with a medium-sized telescope. And they go by the catalog numbers 95, 96, and 105 in Charles Messier's catalog. Here's one that Charles uh, missed though. This is NGC 2903, or the Catherine Wheel as I call it. It's a lovely barred spiral galaxy in Leo, about 20 million light years away from us. And uh, you see that bar across the middle in the red pink colour of the nucleus and the blue spiral arms there. It's really quite an attractive looking object. There are lots of other groups of galaxies that are visible inside Leo. But we're going to zoom back over to the next constellation and that's Virgo and that's of course the moon sat in the middle of the body of Virgo there just at the moment. That will move from night to night but there's the uh, stick diagram of Virgo and there she is holding her bunch of flowers and again this is the realm of the galaxies. When we look with a telescope all through the uh, area of uh, Virgo we find lots and lots of galaxies there's a whole chain of them here we can see the really big elliptical galaxies there in the center and some smaller spiral galaxies dotted around and this is the Virgo cluster it's 50 million light years away here's the high resolution telescope view showing how beautiful these galaxies are and we are being drawn towards this cluster of galaxies the Virgo group uh, and we're moving towards it at about 2 million miles an hour, in fact, but it's 50 million light years, so it's going to take a very long time for uh, the Milky Way galaxy and all its contents to get there. Here's the constellation next door, Butes the Herdsman. Looks like a giant kite shape with a couple of sticky out bits at the bottom there. Um, very recognisable in the sky, but uh, not quite sure how you made a herdsman from it, but never mind. The brightest star in the, the constellation is that one that you can see there just below center and that is Arcturus and that is a bright orange star. It's just 37 light years away from the sun and about the same mass as our sun but a bit older. Our sun is four and a half billion years old and Arcturus is seven billion. As a result of that greater age, it's used up most of its fuel, converting the hydrogen to helium, and that's why it's swelled up to be an orange giant. Now just next door in uh, the constellation is Messier's object number three, a globular cluster. Now quite a few of these globular clusters, and as we go through into the high resolution picture here, you can see it's made of a terrific number of stars all packed together in a very compact region. And th these globular clusters, there are about 400 of them that orbit round the outside of the Milky Way, rather like bees round a honeypot. They're distributed in every direction. And now we're gonna zoom in on the constellation of Coma Berenices, Berenices hair, this means. It's those three stars there joined together with the two lines. Uh, but there are lots of other stars there. You can see it's just a, representing a bundle of hair just below uh, the two dogs there. We'll come and look at those in a moment. That's another constellation of the hunting dogs. But here's Bernice's hair, rather obscure constellation. 
But inside it, we've got a rather nice looking galaxy that we can go and find called the Black Eye Galaxy. And you can see why it's called the Black Eye Galaxy. It looks like someone's punched it in the nose or in the face there. 24 million light years away from us, so a relatively nearby galaxy again. Most of the galaxies that we can find with amateur telescopes are round about uh, 10, 20, 30 million light years away. It takes a bigger telescope to go much further than that. So that was the Black Eye Galaxy. And we've got another globular cluster, another of these balls of half a million or so stars just outside the uh, Milky Way. This one's a little bit more distant, uh, called M53, and it's 58,000 light years away. So say, just outside it. And over to the left, there's another cluster of stars that uh, you can often find these two together, and they make a good contrast with a pair of binoculars. So those are the main objects worth looking at in that area of Co uh, Coma Berenices. Now we saw this just now, the constellation of Canis Venatici, another small constellation with, uh, well, two main stars in it. So again, I'm not sure how they made two dogs out of two stars, but this is the hunting dogs. Perhaps they're supposed to go with the herdsman next door there, Canis Venatici and Butes, the herdsman. But if we look inside the uh, constellation, again, we're gonna find another few objects that are worth tracking down if you do have a small telescope. The first object though is Cor Caroli, Charles's heart. This is a star and it's the reddest uh, uh, giant star there, there is. There's a bright A-type star there and a smaller component, an F-type star making up a double. And uh, that's a, a very prominent object there, worth having a look at with binoculars. Just here though, we've got the Sunflower Galaxy. Now the spiral structure of this galaxy looks much more um, flocculated, I suppose the word is, more fluffy. Again, 27 million light years away, so part of the same group that the Black Eye Galaxy is in, but uh, the spiral arms definitely look rather different in that particular galaxy. Lots and lots of separate short spiral arms. And the Crox Eye Galaxy, 16 million light years away. Again, showing that very similar fluffy structure. Almost identical to the Sunflower Galaxy. So we'll move on now, pull right back and go to the wide view. There's a very familiar group of stars has now appeared to the uh, right center of the screen there. That's the plow. We can all recognize that, I hope. The tail of the plow, the Big Dipper, the saucepan. It's got various different names. And we're gonna move on uh, a little bit towards midnight just to get everything positioned perfectly. There's a satellite going across the screen there. Quite a few of them. You can see they like to whiz around. And uh, we'll just get everything lined up where I want it. So right in the center of the screen there, you can still see the constellation of the uh, Butes, the herdsman, Arcturus, the bright star, just right of center in that kite shape. But we're gonna go and look now at the plow, the Big Dipper, the saucepan, part of the large constellation of Ursa Major, the Great Bear. So you can see the front uh, legs and the rear legs of the bear there and his head and the tail going off the screen, just next door to Canis Venatici and Coma Berenices there. 
So they can use that as a signpost to try to find things. Right in the tail of the Great Bear, we've got another double star, Mizar and its companion Alcor there. And these can be seen as separate with uh, anyone with good eyesight and uh, you get a nice clear night. They're far enough apart, the naked eye can see them. But if you zoom right in with a powerful telescope, you can discover that Mizar itself is a double, uh, two stars orbiting around each other. And in fact, Alcor also is a double star. So this is a quadruple star system. And uh, these multiple star systems are really quite common. You can already see the next target, that's the Pinwheel Galaxy, Messier 101 in the catalogue. And that's a classic face-on spiral galaxy there with the spiral arms whirling away from the centre. And it's another one of these galaxies that we find around us around 20 million light years away. There's the high resolution sky survey image of the Pinwheel Galaxy. And off to the right there, there's another little spiral and there was another one to the left. If you had sharp eyes, you would have spotted those as the high resolution image kicked in. So we'll pull back away from the Pinwheel Galaxy and we'll cross over now south of the tail of the uh, Great Bear, down below it here. And here we have the Whirlpool Galaxy. And the interesting thing about the Whirlpool Galaxy is that there's a second dwarf galaxy that's come too close to it. And the powerful gravity of the Whirlpool is disrupting and tearing apart that companion and forming a bridge of material between the two. Basically, the uh, Whirlpool Galaxy is eating the smaller one. Uh, and uh, that's how ga galaxies grow. They're cannibalistic. They get big by eating smaller ones. So that was the Whirlpool Galaxy. Now we've got the Owl Nebula, also in Ursa Major. And this is an entirely different type of object. This is what will happen to a star like the Sun or Arcturus. When they finally run out of fuel, they puff off their outer layers, forming what's called a planetary nebula. which has got nothing to do with planets. They just looked round to uh, old ancient people with not very good telescopes but they're the outer atmosphere of stars being puffed away as they die. Just next door to the Owl Nebula, we've got M108, another spiral galaxy. Uh, this one's viewed almost edge on, so you can't really see the spiral arms very well. You can see the dark dust lanes. And this is 45 million light years away, so it's getting out towards the edge of what a standard amateur telescope will reach. So we're going to cross over north and uh, east now of the uh, bowl of the Big Dipper and find another couple of galaxies. It really is galaxy season. These are superbly well placed at this time of year, almost directly above your head. We have Bode's galaxy on the left there with its lovely spiral structure face on to us. And to the right of it, we've got its companion, the Cigar Galaxy. And rather like we had in the Whirlpool Galaxy, the Cigar Galaxy has come too close to its larger neighbour and it, the gravity of it is pulling it apart. You can see all the material being shot out of the, the centre there, of uh, left and right of the uh, centre of the Cigar Galaxy in red. That's hydrogen gas glowing because it's been disrupted and set forming new stars by the disruption of its powerful neighbour. They had a near miss with each other about six million years ago. But we've moved on now from the Great Bear to the Little Bear, Ursa Minor. It's like a smaller version of the saucepan there with the uh, bowl and the big long tail. And this is Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. Now, I should point out that real bears don't have long tails. So they got this a bit wrong when they were making the constellations up. It's more the tail that you would attribute to an animal like a fox, but never mind. We're going to zoom in now on the tip of the tail of the little bear, and that's Polaris, the pole star or the north star. Now this is always visible from anywhere in the uh, night sky. If you're in the northern hemisphere, it'll be somewhere because it sits directly above the pole of the earth. If you stood at the North Pole and looked directly above your head, it would be right above you. But the further south you go, 
the uh, lower it is in the sky, but it's always north of you. And as the world turns on its axis, the whole sky seems to pivot around the pole star, which stays still. You can also see how a lot of the satellites that are whizzing across the screen here are whizzing in polar orbits. So they seem to go very close to Polaris in the sky. Now we're running time backwards and we're just gonna put everything back where we were. Over to the uh, right of the screen, you can see the W shape of the constellation of Cassiopeia with the band of light of the Milky Way running through it. That's almost directly opposite the uh, Great Bear in the sky. And so at this time of year, it's quite low and uh, to the north, not the best time for looking at that. So right, we're back to midnight now and we've uh, put the uh, pole star back there with uh, Polaris there right in the center of the screen. And we're gonna pull back a little bit. You can see um, the bowl of the Great Bear up to the left there, top left. But we're going to look over here at a smaller constellation called Lyra. This is supposed to be a Greek musical instrument called the Lyre. L-Y-R-E in Greek, and uh, it's that uh, rectangular arrangement of stars, a um, parallelogram, that's the word, and one bright star just off to the side there. It's a very bright star called Vega. So we'll have a look at Vega. It's one of the uh, nearby stars, only 25 light years away. And it's hotter and brighter than the sun. It puts out about 40 times more energy. And the sun has a temperature of 5,700 degrees. And Vega there is 9,000, considerably hotter. A very bright, white hot colored star. But right in the middle of this uh, constellation, just at the, uh, between the, the lower two stars at the bottom, we've got another of these dying star remnants, a planetary nebula. And this one is the ring nebula. This one we're looking at straight down its polar axis. And so you can see how the ring of material has been puffed off. And we're seeing right in the center there, the dead nuclear core of the original star, a white dwarf star, the remnant left over after all of the atmosphere has been puffed away. There are quite a few of those uh, so, sort of objects in the sky and they're really quite uh, attractive to look at. But you do need quite a big telescope to see them because they're rather small. But to zoom in a very long way there to show you that beautiful view. The Milky Way running across the bottom of the screen there with its dark dust lanes and the milky colour of millions and millions of stars and the constellation of Cygnus running along its back there as a sort of cross shape with the neck outstretched to the right and the wings up and down. You can probably make that out. Lots of satellites whizzing across the sky. We're heading towards the dawn now and we're gonna aim for 315 just before it starts to get light and stop. And there will be a reason for that. And that is because we are gonna show you some of the planets in a moment. But first, here's the constellation of Sagittarius, and uh, this is an archer. It looks more like a teapot to me, uh, and you can see that teapot shape there. But if we show the artwork, somehow that is supposed to represent uh, a centaur firing an arrow, and I really can't make that out. I guess they hadn't invented teapots. But this is the direction, when we look this way, we're looking towards the star clouds of the center of our galaxy. And here's the Eagle Nebula with the pillars of creation in the center there. The Hubble Space Telescope took a very uh, iconic color photograph of, of those. Here we can see the white stars and the pink of glowing hydrogen gas. Again, that same color pink in the Swan Nebula. These nebulae are where new stars are being formed as cold ga gas attracts together with dust under gravity and all pulls itself together into dense knots that go on to fall in and compress themselves to form stars. This is the Lagoon Nebula, another star cloud where new stars are being formed. 
you can see quite a lot of the bright, hot, white stars that have been born in the centre of the Lagoon Nebula here as a new star cluster that's emerging from the cocoon in which it formed. And just next door to the Lagoon Nebula, we've got the Triffid Nebula, one of my favourite objects. You've got the nebula clouds there showing different colours, pink from hydrogen, and then some blue from a very hot blue star that's uh, off to the right of centre there, shining and lighting the gas up with its blue light. And the dark dust lanes carving their way across in front of the nebula gas there. So lots and lots of objects in this region. It's very rich in star clusters and nebulae because it's a very dense piece of the Milky Way. Lots of dark dust lanes across the Milky Way itself you can see there that are blocking our line of sight. So that's worth scanning with a pair of binoculars. You'll find all sorts of interesting things. But I stopped at 3.15 because it's the perfect time to look at some of the planets that are lurking in the morning sky at the moment. And here is Jupiter. This is what a, uh, an amateur telescope would first show of Jupiter and its four large moons. We've got the cloud belts running across the equatorial plane of Jupiter there, north and south of it, and the darker polar regions. That's what you would actually see with the eye uh, through uh, maybe a six inch or an eight inch telescope. With a more powerful telescope, you can zoom in and I can take images like this with the telescope in my observatory showing the cloud belts and all of the turbulence and the movement of smaller spots. The great red spot happens to be on the other side of Jupiter at the moment and that uh, happens about half the time as it spins around. And we can see one or two of Jupiter's smaller moons there just off, off to the left. But the big four are Io, which we're zooming in on right now, and this uh, shows a slight yellow colour to the telescope but Spacecraft images show this pizza-like effect with uh, lots of different colours of sulphur. Sulphur can form black, yellow, orange or white forms and Io is so volcanic the whole surface is covered in sulphur. We pull away from Io and move to the second nearest moon, that's Europa. Both of these are about the same size as our own Earth's moon and Europa is fascinating because it's covered in ice with these grooves and uh, gashes in it up, with, up through which it looks like brown organic material has been welling and we believe from studies that there's a ocean underneath the thick ice crust and it's potential habitat for alien life uh, underneath swimming around in the oceans of Europa. Here's the next moon, Ganymede, and this is actually a larger moon. It's the largest moon in the solar system and bigger even than the planet Mercury that we saw at the beginning of this planetarium show. Covered in glaciers flowing across the surface and this also has the potential for having a liquid water ocean underneath that surface layer. So we're pulled back and now we'll look at Callisto. <clears throat> very dark in colour and a very ancient surface covered in craters uh, so not an enormous amount of geological activity on Callisto and that's because it's furthest away from Jupiter and doesn't orbit in a uh, pattern that the other three all take part in they're all the other three are all locked in tug of war with each other which keeps them stirring their surfaces up through gravitational energy and tidal forces. But right next door to the planet Jupiter at the moment in the sky we've got another bright object and that is Saturn. Now if we look at Saturn through a small telescope it'll look like this. You'll see the body and you'll see the rings even with a six inch telescope or perhaps with a very powerful pair of binoculars you might just be able to see the rings You'll also be able to pick out some of the moons. The biggest and brightest is Titan. And then we have Dione, Rhea, Tethys, Enceladus, Mimas, Hyperion. And there are lots of them and they're all orbiting around outside the rings of Saturn there. You can see a few of the smaller ones. The more powerful telescope, the more of the moons you'll be able to pick out. And uh, it's quite a good sport chasing down to work out which one's which and using a star atlas or an app on a phone to help you. 
you can almost always guarantee to see Titan. It's uh, very recognisable. It has this slightly orange colour to it through a telescope. And that is because it has got an atmosphere all of its own that's uh, even denser than our own atmosphere. And it's full of smoggy orange clouds. So we can't see the surface. But the Cassini probe did drop uh, a lander down through the clouds. It parachuted down and showed us that underneath those clouds there are lakes and rivers and uh, it's obviously got its own weather going on with clouds, rain and snow falling. But all of the rain and the snow and the rivers are made not of water but of liquid methane. Now here we have the final object on our tour and that's the planet Mars just visible before dawn and it's showing a three-quarter phase. It's going to be better observed later in the year when we catch up with it and overtake it on the inside and we'll be at a closest approach later on this year. But uh, there it is in the morning sky and the two moons there, Phobos and Deimos, fear and terror to go with Mars, the god of war. Now if we zoom right in, you can just see on the bottom there the South Polar Cap, a small white area. It's summer in that region at the moment, so the polar cap is quite small. And also the big gash across the left centre there, that's Valles Marinaris, the Martian Grand Canyon. Uh, that if it was on Earth, it would go all the way from Los Angeles to New York. It's absolutely immense, far bigger than our earthly Grand Canyon. So that was a whistle stop tour. It's 3.15 in the morning and Mars glowing there just before in the pre-dawn sky. And if I let time run any further forward, then the sun will soon rise above the horizon. We really don't get very long nights at all in June. It's not a hugely uh, great month for astronomers from that point of view, because we only get a couple of hours of darkness around uh, midnight to 1 a.m. The rest of the time it's really twilight and you can see as time's going forward here that we're losing the stars progressively uh, one or two satellites whizzing across there's so many of them up there i remember when i was a first observing when i was a young boy back in the 1970s it was a miracle if we saw one satellite but now you can't miss them there are so many okay thank you very much for watching i hope you've enjoyed this uh, tour of the night sky for June of 2020 and uh, please uh, do watch some of my other videos on other subjects uh, related to astronomy that are on my ch YouTube channel. You'll see the subscribe button I hope and uh, that should allow you to uh, not miss any of them.